morning, church. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, open with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. As we're going to close out our series on the end of day, so if you've been coming, you know we've done um, death, and you know we've done heaven, and that leaves us with hell. Um, so if you've been coming, and you knew that this was the hell week, and you came anyway, um, kudos to you. You get a extra crown um, in heaven. Uh, we're going to close out today by looking at the reality of the doctrine of hell um, in our end series. Now, from the outset, let me do a couple things, okay? First of all, let me say to you this, that even in the coming week, uh, I prepared this message on a Tuesday morning, um, sitting in a Starbucks, and um, just really felt like God was wanting to do something here today as I prepared the message. And I even sent a message out um, to some of the people um, in our church who I know who I know um, are praying for me and are praying about different things at different times. I just I sent them a text and said, "Will you be praying for this Sunday?" Um, because I could I, I believe it is maybe one of the most important messages that I've preached yet. Not specifically because we're looking at hell, but because as we look at hell, we learn so much about God. Okay. The other thing I want to tell you is this. Let me start by saying that there is no way that I can make today lighthearted or jovial, right? So I, I know part of the, I'm going to call it charm, of coming to hear me on Sunday morning is that I talk like a redneck and tell funny stories about how I, like, smack my kid, right? Not just kidding. Um, don't call DSS. I spank my child. I'm looking at the camera. Um, but I know that that's part of charm. Can I just, I just want to say today that there's no real way for me to do that, okay? Um, I, there's no real way for me to insert um, jokes or, or funny illustrations at different times because the, the message today is too heavy and eternally important. A lot of times when you leave a message, the thing that sticks with you about a message is you may be, not be able to tell me the three points ten years from now, but you can tell me a story. And I don't want you to leave today telling me that, man, I remember that time you preached a story, the, a sermon on hell, but you told a funny story about your car ride with Danny. So th today there's just no real way that I can, that I can be funny or lighthearted or jovial. And what I want to do in that nature, is, in that sense, I want to ask you to help me in this. Maybe over the next 30 minutes, I think it was about 36 last, last um, service, I want you to fight off every temptation to tune out to what's about to be preached here and that's going to come your way. Fight off the temptation to go to the bathroom. Fight off the temptation to get on your phone and scroll through Facebook. Fight off the temptation to lean over to your spouse and, and ask what you're going to do after this. I, I, I just want for 30 minutes to just zone in and allow God to teach us something about this massively important biblical reality today. And if you're a first-time guest, I should probably include this here. Come back next week, right? I, I, I'm glad you're here today. I think you'll love it. I think you'll be like, man, that church is awesome. At least they preached the whole word of God. They preached on hell first time I ever showed up. It'll probably be a while before we talk about it again, right? So you got out of the way, but just just t tune in with me here today. I think you. I, I want you to know it's really important that we do this. Look at Romans 11:22 with me. It's really important today that we spend some time thinking about what hell is and why there is a, such a place as hell. Look at Romans 11, 22. It says this, Note then the kindness and severity of God. What's the Bible saying here? Note how kind God is, right? And now, can I just tell you, we're good at that. We're good at understanding, at looking at, man, God is so kind to us, so good to us, so loving to us, right? So gracious to us. The, but we, oftentimes, uh, if we stop at noting the kindness of God, the problem in that is that we have then only uh, gotten to know half of the character of God. Because there's this whole other aspect included in the character of God that says, note then the severity of God. See, we're good at seeing God's kindness, but in order to really know God, we also have to see His severity. And so as we dive into this topic today, I think there's two important things we need to do at the, outside, at, at the outset of the message. The first thing is this. From the very beginning, we've got to understand what's at stake when we begin to consider a topic like hell. Look at what Francis Chan with, says on the screen with me about this. He says, I'm scared to write a book on hell because so much is at stake. 
Think about it. If I say there is no hell, and it turns out there is a hell, I may lead people into the very place I convinced them did not exist. He said, if I say if there is a hell and I'm wrong, I may persuade people to spend their lives frantically warning loved ones about a terrifying place that isn't real. When it comes to hell, we cannot afford to be wrong. This is not one of those doctrines where you can toss in your two cents, shrug your shoulders, and move on. Too much is at stake. Too many people are at stake, and the Bible has too much to say. Ultimately, we have to understand that when we're talking about hell, eternity is at stake. And not only eternity, the way we live our lives. Because if, the, if hell is true, if there is a real place called hell, it should change everything about the way we go about our day-to-day -day life so life is at stake and eternity is at stake so we must understand that eternity is at stake the second thing we've got to do from the very beginning though is this we got to commit to think biblically about hell oftentimes when we begin to think about hell we let our emotions and our human perspective get in the way and we get we say things that are really not smart we say things like there's no way the God I worship could do that. There's no way the God of the Bible could do that, right? And what, what's happening there is we're letting our human dictates, our emotions tell us what God is like instead of letting Scripture speak to us and, and be clear to us about who God is and what He's like. The thing is, God doesn't answer to you or me. And we have to hear what He has to say on this. Look at what Francis saying. He helps us one more time here. Let's be eager to leave what is familiar for what is true. Nothing outside of God and His truth should be sacred to us. And so it is with hell. If hell is some primitive myth left over from the conservative tradition, then let's see it on that dusty shelf next to other traditional beliefs that have no basis in Scripture. And hear me say this from the very, out, out, the very start, okay? If hell, if you can prove to me from Scripture that hell is not a real place and that has no basis in Scripture, I will be the first one to never preach it from this pulpit again. We'll put it on the shelf and we'll never look at it. But he says this. He says if it is true, if the Bible does teach it, that there is a literal hell awaiting those who don't believe in Jesus, then this reality must change us. And it should certainly purge our souls of all complacency. So as we start today, I want to ask you, would you just fight off the temptation to be distracted? And would you, with me, say, I'm going to think biblically about this, and I'm going to understand from the outset. I'm going to understand from the very start what's at stake. Pray with me, and then we're going to get started. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you love us and how you speak to us in your word. And dear God, I thank you, dear God, that honestly there is no ambiguity, ambiguity uh, in the scripture about this topic dear god it's clear it's crystal clear and god i pray that as we dive in and see what scripture says about this dear god that we would uh, leave here with changed hearts and changed minds and changed lives because of it dear god show us who you are clearly because of this in jesus name amen so here's what we need to do today if we want to know about hell the only right question to ask is what does the bible say Okay, if we want to know about the end, we want to know about death, we want to know about heaven, and we want to know about hell, the only right question to answer any of these questions, the only question you should be asking is this, what does the Bible say? So what I want to do as comprehensively as possible in, in 30 minutes, I want to tell you, uh, notice the time hadn't gone down yet, you know, it's old preacher tricks. As comprehensively as I can in the next few minutes, I want to tell you what scripture says about hell, Okay. So read with me Revelation 20, verse 11 through, uh, 11 through 15, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see what the Scripture says here. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated, seated on it. Okay? Um, that's Jesus. Uh, I don't have time to break down everything that's in Revelation because that would be like a 75-hour or day sermon. Okay? So just read with me for what's in heaven and hell, and we'll, we'll leave Revelation uh, to people that are smarter than I am. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. So God's on the throne. you got dead, uh, great and small, standing before God. And the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they have done. 
And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown, listen, into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There are three things, I think, that are comprehensive statements that we need to understand what Scripture says about from the Bible. Here's the first one. Hell is a real and permanent place. Hell is a real and permanent place. As we read through Scripture, the reality of hell becomes inescapable. And now, lest you think that hell is just some outdated, antiquated Old Testament doctrine that has no basis in the New Testament, here's what I want you to know. That Jesus Christ himself talks more about hell in the scriptures than any other person. You see, if you have any familiarity with the Bible, what you know is this. Hell is unescapable. So how should we define hell? How should we think about it based on Scripture? Here's here's the definition based on Scripture I want to give you, and we'll break it down a little bit. Hell is a place of eternal torment and separation where unbelieving and unrepentant sinners experience separation from God and eternal wrath of God. Let's notice a couple different things about this definition. The first thing is this. Hell is a place of eternal torment. Look at Revelation 20, 9 through 10. The Bible says they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down on all those, that is, all those who were lost, all those who were rebelling about God, and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophets were. Listen to this. And they were to be tormented day and night there forever and ever. Over and over and over again in Scripture, when we come across hell, what the Scripture wants to convey to this, convey to us is this last this last sentiment here that the place is a, a place the hell is a place of eternal torment forever and ever now you might be saying with well, that's just like revelation of course revelation says stuff about fire and torment and all this stuff daniel chapter 12 verse uh, verse 2 isaiah 33 14 revelation 19 3 matthew chapter 25 mark chapter 9 on and on i could go and everywhere in the scripture one thing we see about hell is that there is no end to it I like the illustration Thomas Watson, the great uh, Puritan theologian, gives us for this. He said, imagine that you have two two coasts of beach separated uh, by by vast land, and you have one bird, right? And this bird goes to the first beach, and he picks up one grain of sand in his mouth. And he takes that grain of sand, and he takes it to the other coast and drops it. And then he takes another grain, it goes back and gets another grain of sand and drops it. And he does it until the first beach beach is empty. He said, imagine how long it would take a bird to do this. He said, and in, in that time, eternity has only just begun. It never ends. On and on, Scripture says forever and ever. But it's not just a place that lasts forever. This is where the hell becomes hell. Notice the torment that's involved. It said it's a place of eternal torment. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 says, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on its forehead or his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur. Listen. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. What becomes clear is that hell is not only a place that lasts forever in duration. It's a place where the normative second-to-second experience is one of suffering. It's eternal suffering. It's eternal torment. Now, you might say to me this morning with Dallas, isn't a lot of the Bible's language on hell metaphorical? And to that, I would respond with a happy yes. A lot of the language in the Bible about hell is metaphorical. But let me ask you this. What is it metaphorical for? It's not metaphor for a Caribbean vacation, right? We use metaphors in Scripture. God uses metaphors in Scriptures because words fall short of truth, not to sell truth short. 
So when God wants to communicate to us what the reality of eternal of eternal place of torment called hell is actually like, the language that he has to use is the language of a lake of fire. One thing is clear. Hell will be a place of some form of eternal torment where souls are receiving the punishment for their sin and they're receiving it forever. And the suffering will be so severe that the Bible's only language to convey this, to convey this kind of agony is lake of fire and outer darkness. If it's metaphor, how much worse can it actually get? Thomas Watson here again helps us. He says, thus in hell they would die, but they cannot. The wicked shall always be dying, but never dead. The smoke of the furnace ascends forever and ever. Oh, who can endure thus to be ever upon the rack? This word ever breaks the heart. I think Jonathan Edwards helps us form a picture, picture of the agony that awaits in hell. Listen to me as I read as I read to you how he says we should think about it. This is, Jonathan Edwards is arguably the greatest American theologian ever produced. Think, think with me about how he says we should, we should picture hell. To help your conception, imagine yourself to be cast into a fiery oven, all of a glowing heat, or into the midst of a blowing brick clean or of a great furnace where your pain would be as much greater than that occasioned by accidentally touching a coal of fire as the heat is greater. Imagine also that your body were to lie there for a quarter of an hour, full of fire, as full within and without as a bright coal of fire, all the while full of sense. You don't lose your sense. You still you know that you're glowing like a coal. What horror would you feel at the entrance of such a furnace? And how long would that quarter of an hour seem to you if it were to be measured by a glass? How long would the glass seem to be running? And after you had endured it for one minute, how overbearing would it be to you, for, to, you to think that you had yet to endure the other 14? But what would be the effect of your soul if you knew you must lie there in that torment for a full 24 hours? And how much greater still would these enduring that torment to, and how much greater still would the effect if you knew you must endure for a whole year? And how vastly greater still if you knew you must endure it for a thousand years? Oh, then, how your heart would sink if you thought, if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever. That there would be no end. That after millions and millions of ages, your torment would be no nearer to an end than it ever was. And that you should never, never be delivered. But your torment in hell will be immeasurably greater than this illustration represents. How then will the heart of a poor creature sink? How utterly inexpressible and inconceivable must the sinking of the soul be in such a case? Also, though, by definition, I said it was a place of eternal, uh, eternal torment. It's also a place of eternal separation. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1.9. I'll be on the screen. It says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. One of the chief horrors of hell is that the presence of God that used to bring so much unnoticed good into our life, so much of the common grace that God used to give us will be gone. We will be eternally separated from God. Here's my prayer for us today. Listen. As we read Scripture, if we commit to, if we commit to think biblically, what we walk away with is that one thing is certain. That there is a literal place of eternal torment and separation called hell. And as we commit to think biblically about it, what I'm praying happens for us today is this, that God would break our hearts to see how heavy and how serious this actually is. And I, this is where God, man, I, even over the past 24 hours, guys, I'm just going like, to confess 
confess to you how, how unserious we take it, and even in my own life. Even in the past 24 hours, one thing I've realized about my own tongue is that the way I speak betrays how serious I think it is. Think about it with me. Like The way we use the word hell shows that we don't understand how serious we think. And like y'all look at me like, oh, the preacher's been saying a curse word, right? I'm, y'all are sinners too. But we say things like, listen, we say things like, what really got me thinking about it this week, and I, uh, I wish I could tell you I, uh, I, I just stopped right in my tracks, but as I was preparing this message, I thought about it. I was coaching somebody at CrossFit, and they had a bar over their head, right? And the bar, they, they did something crazy with the bar, and I, I was worried that it was going to hit them. I literally said to them, if you do that again, that bar is going to knock the hell out of you, right? Right? And I, what we would consider like, oh, that preacher, mm, he's done, right? Get him off the stage. What we would consider a perfectly appropriate and normal use of the word hell. By default, by me using it in that sentence shows that I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to hell. We say things like, man, you've had a hell of a season. Or, man, that was a hell of a game. Or, that was a hell of a song, right? And what we show by our tongue is that we have no idea what Scripture means when it says hell is a place of eternal torment and eternal separation because we use it as a flippant word when God uses it as a place where sinners are going to go if they don't know Him. May God wake us up to how heavy this reality is. Now, Hell is a place of eternal torment and separation. Yes, we see that from Scripture. I hope that you, if you commit to think biblically, there's no way around that. But here's, here's where I think this may be more important than understanding the first point. If hell is a place of eternal wrath and torment, we need to understand why a place like hell is necessary. So when Scripture talks about hell to us, there are two things, that, or a couple things that would have us say. The first one is that we need to understand hell is real. The second thing we need to understand is this. Eternal punishment is necessary. For a lot of us, this, and I would say even for our cultural context, this is massively important because we need to know that hell is not arbitrary or pointless. Right? Because if we're honest, when we hear about places like hell, even as I read to you about what hell is going to be like this morning, what you kind of think is, man, that sounds kind of harsh. You, you mean all sinners go there? Like, what you mean is just like murderers and, and child molesters and rapists go there, right? That's what you mean. And no, what Scripture means is that all sinners go there. So, like, Scripture has a category for hell, right? That you cheated and lied on your taxes, you defrauded someone else, sinner, hell. And we, honestly, if we wrestle with that, our thought is like, man, this seems unreasonable. Like, Jim, John, Joe, they're good people, man. All they ever did was say a few cuss words, right? Maybe, maybe drank a little too much. And God, you're saying you're going to send them to hell? If we're honest with ourselves, I think what we would say is, Man, this seems like a vast overreaction. But we need to know this morning, Scripture would have us know this morning, that hell is not arbitrary or pointless. Hell is divinely necessary. If you're taking notes, write this down. Hell is necessary because hell is a place of justice. Look with me at Proverbs 17, 15. Scripture says this. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. In other words, what Scripture is saying here, for someone, anyone, especially God, to look at the wrong and say to them, you are right, would be an abomination in God's sight. Why is that? Because what we know about God based on Scripture is this that he is what we would call a righteous judge. He is always ruling rightly. He never overlooks sin, and he never lets anyone off the hook. 
So the one thing that God cannot do because he is God, right, is this, is overlook sin. Because he says in Scripture, for anyone to say to the wrong, you are right, is an abomination. Let me, let me put it to you like this. Imagine that we have one of these mass shootings, right? And, and it, it horrifies the nation. People are dead. And, but we, instead of and, uh, we catch the gunman or whatever, and the gunman goes on trials, national trial, right? We've had a few of these in the past couple of years where we get to see the trial. And when it comes time for sentencing, the judge looks to the guy and says, man, you are guilty as sin. But you know what? You're good, man. Have fun. Get out of here. Uh, you're off the hook. If that were to happen, there would rightfully be riots in the streets. Why? Because good judges don't do that. And what Scripture is saying here is that if God is a good judge, the one thing he can never do is look to sinners and say, hey, man, you're good. Don't worry about it. Sin must be called out and punished accordingly because God is a God of justice. Now, if you're taking notes, write this down too. It's important to know this. Hell is a place of proportionate justice. Hell is not just a place of harsh justice. Hell is a place of proportionate justice. The best way I know to explain it to you, and I've explained it to you this way before, is you always receive the penalty in proportion to who you sin against, right? Think about it this way. If I walk out the door out back, I kick a cat. What, what happens to me? Absolutely nothing. You know why? Because cats are evil things, right? No, a matter of fact, I may get rewarded, all right? If I kick a dog, what happens? Peter's going to be like, oh, Peter's going to be all up in here. It's going to be weird. They're going to be like, this guy kicked the dog. Get him off the stage, okay? If I walk out and one of your kids is walking by, right? And I mean, I just wham as he's going by. This is as lighthearted as it gets today. Enjoy it, okay? And the kid walks by and I just roundhouse kick him, right? What happens then? I'm probably going to die, right? Because mama ain't going to like that too much. And the cops are getting caught. Now, what happens if I jump the south lawn at the White House, go to run into the back of the Oval Office, and I waylay Donald Trump with one? What happens? Nine, two to the chest, one to the head, right? Why? Because Donald Trump, the president, whoever the president is, the president is more important right now than you are. I've sinned against a higher office. Does that make sense? You are always punished in proportionate to the one who you sin against. You kick a cat, there is no punishment. You kick the president, you're probably going to die. Justice is proportionate to the one you sin against. Now, imagine with me, you don't sin against the president, but you sin against the God, the eternally holy God, who the angels see, and the angels, even though they have never sinned, they cover their faces, and they fly back and forth day and night, and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Imagine that you sin against the eternally holy one. What is justice in that case? Justice in that case is eternal punishment. The eternal suffering of hell, listen, is not a divine overreaction. It's divine justice. It's not as if, God is my three-year-old having a temper tantrum about something when they don't get their way. God's not up in heaven like, man, you didn't do it my way. Hell, right? That's the way some of us read Scripture. You know what that betrays, though? It betrays that we don't know the God of Scripture. Because the God of Scripture is never having a divine temper tantrum throwing people in hell. What we see in the, in the God of Scripture is actually like the story of Noah and the ark, right? Where it took Noah 500 some years to build the ark, and every day God's just like, man, maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day they turn. Maybe today's the day they repent. Maybe today I don't have to send them to hell. Man, I wish today would be the day. Until finally the justice of God demands that the door on the ark be closed. It's never, it's never a divine temper tantrum. And hell seems appalling to the world. Listen, society would say this is an outdated Christian doctrine because it feels wrong to us. The problem is society doesn't know our God. And similarly, I would say to you, if this morning it feels like hell is wrong to you, then it's not your view of hell that is wrong, it's your view of God. 
Because what you're saying is, God, you are not good enough for me to warrant that. Hell is not arbitrary. Hell is necessary because God is God. So I want you to, I want you to think biblically about hell this morning. I want you to see that hell is a real and permanent place. I want you to see that hell is divinely necessary. There has to be a place called hell because God is God called God. And the third thing I want you to see is this. Christ took the punishment of hell for us. When God gives us a theology of hell, when God gives us everything we need to know about hell in Scripture, the most important thing to see about hell from the Scripture is this. Christ took the punishment of hell for us. Look with me at Romans 3. 23 through 25. This is what the Bible says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ. Now, verse 25, I want to stop right here and I want to tell you something. Verse 25 may be the most important verse in the Bible. Okay? I didn't say it was my favorite verse, like it gives me the warm and fuzzies. I said it's the most important because it explains the Bible. Every, everything hinges on Romans 3.25, okay? This is what the Bible says. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to re be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Okay, so here's what you need to be asking right now. You say, Dallas, God can never overlook sin. He's a righteous judge. Well, the problem with that is if you know your Bible, you know there are a lot of times when God overlooks sin, right? Think with me about the most famous illustration is David, right? David sleeps with Bathsheba, kills Uriah, sweeps it under the rug. I literally love this, man. He sweeps it under the rug, right? Literally like, man, I'm off the hook, right? And what happens? Prophet Nathan comes to to David tells him a story about how some guy stole this other guy's goat, and David's furious. He's like, man, that guy's going to be put to death. And you know what Nathan says? Favorite, favorite line. Sam, is it Nathan? Nathan, yeah. Nathan looks at him and says, you are the man. And all of a sudden, all of David's sin is laid before everyone. The adulterer, the murderer, it's exposed. It's brought back from out. And this is my favorite part of the story most beautiful lines in the Bible. Here's what God says to him. David, I put your sin away. So the sin comes out from under the rug. God puts it back. He's like, hey, I just want you to know, I know I'm putting it back under the rug. He literally looked at David, the guy who was in the wrong, and said, you are right. That is a huge problem. Because one thing we said God couldn't do is overlook sin. There has to be a place called hell because God cannot overlook sin. This is where I want you to see this. You may not even know this. Scripturally, the greatest tension in all the Bible is this, that throughout the story of the Bible, the reality is the reality that somebody must pay the price for sin. But God, because he loves sinners, wants to do like what he did with David and say, hey man, your sin's forgiven. Don't worry about it. But if he does that, then he's no longer God because then he's not a good judge anymore. So read through Scripture, and this is the tension of the Bible. How can a good God forgive wrath-deserving sinners? And here's what we come to in Romans 3.25. The Bible says that God himself in the form of Christ comes forward as a propitiation. I'm from South Georgia. Let me tell you something. I do not know how to spell propitiation. I do know what it means. It's a big church word that means a payment put forward for a debt. A payment put forward for a penalty that is owed. So what the Bible is telling us here in Romans 3.25 is that though there had to be justice paid by sinners, what God did in Jesus Christ as he came to sinners and said, I will pay the debt that you owe. So God, basically, this is what God did. He came up with two ways for justice to be had. Because God can never look at those who are wrong and say right, he came up with two ways for justice to be had. The first way is this. Sinners could pay the price for their sin in hell. That's the first way justice can be had. 
If you're a sinner and you go on in unrepentant sin, justice will be had over your dead body in the pit of hell because God will send you there to pay the price for the justice that he demands. Now you're like, man, not my God. You need to read the Bible because that's what the Bible says is going to happen. Justice will be had by God because he cannot overlook sin. Or option number two is this. And it's the gospel just as clear as I can give it to you guys. God would overlook the sin of sinners and place it on Jesus, and he would pay the price for their sin. So you have two options. You can pay the price for your sin in hell, or Jesus can pay the price for your sin on the cross. This is the gospel, that though you deserve hell, though you deserve the death and the eternal torment and separation for sin, Christ has come. And Christ has borne on, our, on the cross our sin that he might take the punishment of hell we deserve. The cup of God's wrath that was meant for me and meant for you was swallowed up by Jesus Christ on the cross. So that when we understand what the Bible says about hell, the most important thing is that though it is divinely necessary, though that those who don't have Christ will go there, the most important thing we can understand is that I don't have to go there. The best illustration I can give you is this. Imagine you're standing before the Hoover Dam. Everybody got a picture of the Hoover Dam in your mind, that massive dam? And that dam, you're standing there on the other side of it, dry land, and you're watching... And all of a sudden, you see a pebble break loose of that dam, and a little shot of water comes out, right? And in that moment, you know you don't have a chance, right? You can run, but what good is running going to do from the Hoover Dam if it breaks? And then another pebble and another pebble, and all of a sudden, the, the, the structure of the dam starts to crumble. And you are standing before the Hoover Dam with water that is about to very literally crush your soul. And then all of a sudden, in the last moment, the ground before you opens up and all of that that was just about to consume you is swallowed up. That is what Jesus Christ did on the cross because the wrath of God was aimed like an arrow, the Bible says, at the sinners of man, at the sins of man. And at the last moment, Jesus Christ took the cup and drank it to the dregs. Here's what I want you to see this morning. When we look at hell, we have noted the severity of God. But when we look at hell, and we look at what all the Bible has to say about hell, when we come to the gospel, we see the kindness of God. And you cannot understand the kindness of God. You cannot understand the goodness of God. You cannot understand the love of God toward you until you come to grips with the severity of God, with the wrath of God. And so this morning, how do you even close a message that's this heavy? Like, go in peace, right? We just talked about hell for 30 minutes, 38. Here's what I want to do. I want to do a couple things. Number one, if you've never been saved and you're headed for hell, what I want to do is I want to offer you the opportunity today to pray with somebody to receive salvation. There are going to be two people, or uh, one or two people standing back here at this door. Uh, it, when we pray in just a few minutes, if you've never been saved, and you say, I would, if I died right now, I'd go to hell, but I want to be saved, you, they, go back to the door. They'll have their hands up if you need to recognize them, and, and they'll pray with you, okay? I would love for that to happen. The second thing I want to do is if you're a Christian, this message above all messages should make you leave out of here rejoicing, right? Like, I, I'm telling you, before I preached this message, I was slapped crunk in the first service, right? You don't know why? Because here's one thing I know. Hell cannot touch me. So you need to be willing to worship today because of that. And the third thing I want to do is this. I want us to leave here today and realize that the mission God has given us is too urgent to take lightly because the reality of hell is coming. Guys, this is why we do what we do as a church. It's because we want the name of God to be glorified, and the more the name of God is glorified, the less people will spend eternity in hell. We're going to three services after Easter. Can I tell you, we're not going to three services because we're like, man, we, can't, we want to think of ways to spend all day up at the church. 
we're going to three services because, man, maybe, just maybe, God would save someone. And so what I want to challenge you to do is if you're a believer, if you need to get saved, go get saved. If you're a believer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of one person in your life who needs the gospel. And then when I start to pray, I want you to come down here and fill this altar up, and I want us to pray for people, even just one person who needs to know Jesus, who needs to be saved from hell. And I want us to pray that God would do it. And I, oh, that preacher's challenging us to come pray. No, I mean, I want you to mean it in your guts, that rather than see someone go to hell, you would come pray that God would you show them your kindness. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, and we're going to close with this. I'm going to pray. As I start praying in just a minute, I want to invite you to come down forward and, down forward and pray. Uh, after a few minutes, I will pray to dismiss us. There's not going to be another song. I'll pray to dismiss us, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. But as I start praying in just a second, you guys come down if you want to pray. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Pray with me. God, I pray that if there's anybody who um, is on our heart and on our mind this morning, dear God, we would just come forward right now, dear God, and, and pray, dear God. Even as uh, people were coming, dear God, I just thank you for that. Dear God, might we be a church that could fill the altar to pray for those who need you. Lord, I just pray, God, not to preach hell to be down, not to preach hell to, to be mean, dear God, but to talk about hell because it's a biblical reality and people are going to go there, dear God, without the gospel. So break our hearts for this reality. God, as people are down front right now, dear God, even... Um, Dear God, in the first service, as people were down front with wet eyes, dear God, here's what I would pray, dear God. Not only those who need the gospel, dear God, those who are obstinate to the gospel, dear God. Those who are our children, those who are our spouses, those who are hurting and far away from you. We come before you right now and we lift them up to you, God, and pray, would you please save them, God. Whatever it takes, save them. And Lord, I just... Even as I, as I get on my knees before you, God, I pray, God, would you make the most important thing in my life the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord? We're going to sit here for just a moment and pray, God. Hear our prayer. there are souls we're praying for this morning, God. And God, I just pray that maybe, just maybe, you would do something bigger than we can imagine to save the souls around us, God. I pray, Lord, uh, uh, God, even as I preach on hell, dear God, there's just so much, so many unanswered questions, so many things that hurt, so many uh, things we just weigh, dear God. Maybe we've lost loved ones and we don't know where they're at for eternity, dear God. Lord, you are the counselor who brings peace. You are the God of all grace. And I just pray that you would bring us peace as we leave here today with those issues, God. And God, I pray that more than anything, we would leave here knowing that the God of glory took upon himself the wrath of God for the sins of the sinners. We love you, Lord, and we worship you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed, Harrison Bridge. Thank you so much. Love you guys. See you next week.